Good morning, everyone. How many times have you heard that since lockdown? Your microphone is off. <laughs> okay, so um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of the Spark event today. I feel it's a great privilege to be here with Tiki um, and with Carlo, who are both doing fabulous things. Um, as Lynette mentioned, what we do is we try to create a better world of work, and we do that through leaders and teams. And really core to our work is we like to provoke people. So I'm going to start the session. I've got 15 minutes with you. I want to start the session um, with three provoking questions. In the 15 minutes, um, I want to kind of set the scene um, for Tiki and Carla. So here are my three questions for you. So the first one is, why are you here? So you're probably thinking to yourself, why am I here at this event? And that's part of the question. But really what I'm asking you is, why are you here on this planet? And is that clear in your mind? Are you thinking about it? The second question I want to ask you is, why is your business on the planet? And can you answer that without just saying we're here to make money? And the third question is, where do I start? Um, we see from uh, something called the Edelman Trust Barometer, for those of you who know it, it's an annual survey um, and it measures levels of trust globally. And what we're seeing is that there is a new mandate that's being issued for both business and leaders. Um, and the stats tell us that 75% of people who take this global survey believe that businesses should make money as well as improve society, which is quite a high figure. The 2019 results tell us that 92% of people who respond to this survey, including South African results, feel that CEOs must stand up and speak out on issues of the day. That for me is quite an incredible stat, I think you'll agree. This is a company called Sealand Gear. So it's actually a South African company, they're based in Cape Town. So I'll give you a second to read that. And the second part of it particularly, we are the makers or the breakers of this world. There has never been a more important time to make environmentally responsible decisions. And you can see this kind of ethos weaved into what they do. If we look at the next slide, and I want you to focus on the left-hand side of the slide, there's a few more companies there. Patagonia, uh, and the Presencing Institute. Now, Patagonia is a company that makes outdoor clothing and gear. And the Presencing Institute uh, provide online education. They're kind of a think tank. They do research. They bring people together. And when you see those two statements underneath those logos, we're in business to save the planet and profound societal renewal. You kind of wonder what, what that's all about. And these are the responses that these two for-profit companies will give you when you say to them, why do you exist as a business? So what we see with this kind of orientation is that they're directed by purpose. So they don't say, Patagonia doesn't say we're in business to make money and these are our financial targets. They say we're in business to save our planet. And if you unpick that a bit, and I've listed it, uh, I've copied the paragraph here, at Patagonia we appreciate that all life on Earth is under threat of extinction. We're using the resources we have, our business, our investments, our voice, and our imaginations to do something about it. And I encourage you to go and have a look at their website to explore how they're doing this. What they're actually doing is they're using purpose as a strategy. It's a type of consciousness for them, and it really does direct how they connect, what they do, how they work with suppliers, the kinds of people they attract to work for them, their partners, um, the kinds of people they attract to um, to be employed in the company. So it completely shifts the reason why a person would get up in the morning. So if I ask you to think about getting up in the cold, in the dark, getting dressed, feeding the kids, um, I won't say going to work because none of us are going many places these days, but when you get up in the morning, if you knew that the work that you were about to do today was contributing to something like this, to a purpose like this, how would it change how you show up and what you do? Especially in really tough times like now with COVID, what would it change? So if we have a look at the next slide, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, how does this work? Now, this isn't an advert that Patagonia released on Black Friday. We all know what Black Friday is. It's where everybody rushes to buy the things that they don't need at a quarter of the price. 
So this is the advert that they released. And they said, don't buy this jacket. Do not buy our Patagonia jacket. And the reason they say this, and I'm reading from their book, to make it required 135 liters of water, enough to meet the daily needs, three glasses of a day of 45 people. The journey from its origin as 60% recycled polyester to our warehouse generated nearly 20 pounds of carbon dioxide, 24 times the weight of the finished product. And the jacket left behind on its way to Remo, two thirds of weight in waste. However, this 60% recycled polyester jacket knit and sewn to the highest standard is exceptionally durable, so you won't have to replace it often. And when it comes to the end of its, its useful life, we'll take it back to recycle into a product of equal value. As is true of all things we make and that you can buy, this jacket comes with an environmental cost higher than its price. And this is why they've launched something called the Common Threads Initiative. So they really are committed to reducing, repairing, reusing, recycling. And they say to us, they say to us, you and I, what happens if we could re imagine a world where we only take what nature can replace? It's quite a, it seems like quite a big ask. It seems like a strange advert to launch on Black Friday. If we'd move to the next slide, you're probably thinking now, how are sales for Patagonia? Well, sales seem to be pretty good for Patagonia. So um, they are winning support with this kind of approach. And if we move one more slide to the next slide. The reason is, and we see the evidence from it coming through now, which is very encouraging. The reason is because when you run a company with a clearly defined purpose and a more conscious business line, so if you have a purpose, conscious leadership, a stakeholder orientation, a conscious culture, what you find is that your profits, your, your financial performance vastly outstrips the performance of less conscious companies. And I feel so encouraged and inspired to see this evidence. There is a website called Fergus of Endearment. Go and have a look. So these more conscious companies are outstripping the performance of less conscious peers by up to six times for the Jim Collins good to great companies. So I know that's throwing quite a bit of information at you there. But the point is that there is hard evidence to show that doing good and doing well has a real, um, can exist, coexist. It is actually better than just aiming to bring in profits, which is the profit only motive. So if we move to the next slide, we've got a choice. We can jump left into a very competitive landscape, or we can jump right. So instead of fighting and competing for market share, we are moving to a world where we create, we create and we collaborate. The kind of world that I think Sealand, Patagonia, Presenting Institute are trying to move into. And I think Tiki will talk to this in a presentation, but no one is perfect, no company is perfect, but we're all on a journey. You're probably asking me now, or thinking in your head, that sounds great, but it sounds a bit lofty, so where do we start? So what I want you to think about is leadership, not as a title in a company, but a type of consciousness. And I want you to think about being a leader from wherever you are. So you don't have to be in some kind of position of influence to lead. Because when you start to lead from your own personal position, wherever you are, you can start to spread a ripple out. So how do we start where we are with what we have? Because all we ever have is the present moment. So if we flick to the next slide, I want to do a little quick exercise with you. I want you to have a look at this scale of motivations and I want you to think, where am I? So below the line are the deficiency needs. So it's when we feel we have to self-assert, when we're feeling angry, when we're craving and we feel like we need to stockpile and hoard when we feel fearful or anguish, right down to feeling almost apathetic. And we see a lot of this um, specifically in the last few months of a lockdown. Uh, the higher needs are being uh, more cooperative, feeling like you have power within. And you'll see that's an exact mirror to, for example, the minus three, which is the craving. So power within, feeling mastery over your craft, generative, uh, uh, inventing new products and services, taking business models a step further, going beyond what's been done before, right to the very top, which is higher service. So just take 30 seconds to think to yourself, 
where have I been mostly over the last two weeks or maybe month? So I want to just give you a sense of, um, to allay some fears here. As human beings, we spend about 80% below the line. <laughs> so if you see yourself below the line and you're thinking, geez, is there something wrong? It's our natural orientation to scan the environment and look for threats. So we find that a lot of our time is spent below the line. Uh, however, if we can move above the line, this is where we learn to play the infinite game, where we don't play the game of business or life to have winners and losers and to play through resources and to end the game. If we're above the line, this is what um, the space in which we um, can collaborate, imagine new futures um, and play the infinite game. You might have heard of this concept being spoken about by Simon Sinek. So what we say is take a minute, think, where am I? And when you've got that in your mind, think, how does that impact the people around me? Okay, and what can I do to move above the line? And often just being aware of where you are helps already to move above the line. I just want to reinforce this, um, this concept here. When we look at that above the line, below the line, and some of us will be sitting in the anger, fear, anguish, quite low down on that scale, especially during COVID. When we think about struggling, it's not a random struggle through all of the, the pains that life throws at us. And there's some really deep pains happening right now. It's about seeking a distinct set of actions, a distinct struggle. And this distinct set of actions, which Daniel Coyle refers to, for me in my mind, comes back to that sense of purpose. What is the purpose running through? What, why are you here? Why is your business here? When you have that kind of golden thread moving through everything, it changes the way we show up, get up, changes that perception of the, what the world is throwing at us. The marvelous Margaret Heffernan, if you don't know her work, please go and look her up. She's a complete ins inspiration. She talks about us having moved from a world that is complicated to a world that's complex. So in the complicated world, things are linear, there seem to be more rules. We could plan, manage, repeat, control, and we could impose some routine and efficiency, and that was really helpful for us. But now we live in a more complex world, and things are more fluid, which means they're not linear. So that means that one small change can have a disproportionate impact. But very, um, very poignantly, it also means that we really can't predict anymore. So for example, We've known for a very long time, and you would have seen some TED talks about all of the predictions of um, a possible pandemic and the fact that viruses can jump from bats to humans or wherever it came from. So we knew this was coming, but we couldn't say 2020 will be the year. So we know more than we've ever known. We're more connected. We have more tools at our fingertips, but we're less able to predict with any certainty. So it means as humans, we need to get used to that uncertainty. And if we flick to the next side. So what Margaret Heffernan says is just because we don't know the future doesn't mean we're left helpless. So start wherever you are. There are no rules, but rich futures are mapped by those with the energy to convene, the passion to learn from the widest variety of human imagination, paying attention, changing course, discovering and inventing what the world demands of us all. The sheer creativity of human action interaction has never been more critical. So if we use that as a kind of a call to action and we say, where are we now? What are we doing on the planet? And what are our businesses doing on the planet? And how do we use our shared creativity and our human interaction to create something new, different, positive, exciting? Thanks very much.